I'll give a general introduction for this session. Mm -hmm. So welcome everybody. I hope everybody uh, still has energy for the last session of today. So this is a session on detection and diagnosis. And my name is Colin Jacobs. I'm from Radboud University Medical Center, and I'll be chairing this session together with Christian Baumgartner. Christian, maybe you can quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, my name is Christian. I'm heading the machine learning and medical image analysis lab in at the University of Tübingen. And exactly, I will be co-chairing with uh, Colin today. So we'll be uh, dividing this session into two parts of three papers. Um, we'll start with L7, L8, and L9. If you have questions for the others, please uh, use the live chat to ask them, and we will bring them to the attention of the authors. Pre prefix your questions with the paper number so that we can easily find out to which uh, paper a certain question is aimed at. And with that, I'll give the word to Christian for the who will be uh, introducing the first three papers. Okay, um, exactly. So, as Colin just made, mentioned, we'll turn around the order. We start with paper L7. Um, I will just at this point give the word directly to the presenters. Um, you each have 90 seconds to present your work. And after that, we will have the question session. So, you can start now. Uh, sorry, I think okay. someone put we said L7. Okay. Oh, Elsa. So, uh, okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Simon from Finbrain. Uh, today I'm talking about our work go she said online active learning for efficient x-ray image annotation. Uh, in medical image uh, acquired annotated data is hard because of uh, annotation costs and uh, the inter agreement between uh, annotators are hard to obtain. Uh, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, I think you only have one slide for the short orals. Ah, okay. So, so uh, our method uh, go uh, use active learning to substantially reduce the uh, amount of data uh, that need to be annotated. Uh, this reduce the uh, cost and uh, the disagreement between uh, annotators. So our method uh, picks uh, the data point that uh, that are near the decision boundary. Uh, we then refine those uh, data points using a uh, TB scan clustering algorithm to uh, extract uh, data points that have uh, tens uh, neighborhood. We then give those data points to annotators. Uh, our method on also leverage uh, high confidence uh, data points uh, to assign label to those data points uh, because uh, those pseudo label uh, after each active learning iteration, those pseudo label are quite uh, can change drastically. We use a running average confidence score uh, to uh, stabilize the pseudo label. So with the newly annotated data and uh, the pseudo label data, with the current data, we can retrain a new model. Um, the whole process is repeated until uh, the model reach a certain performance on the test set. So our experiments show that uh, our method uh, compared with cost-effective active learning uh, increase the performance gain per annotated data. We also uh, tested our method uh, using check expert data set. However, uh, the performance of all active learning methods on that data set are quite unstable. We hypothesized that um, uh, annotation uh, extracted from medical report are quite noisy. So active learning uh, are not suitable for the okay, those cases. So that, that is the um, end of Simon. the talk. Thanks for okay. uh, Looking forward to your question. Uh, thank you. Okay, so next speaker, please. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan. I'm from Fuchs Lab and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in Manhattan, New York City. Sorry, this uh, slide isn't the final version I sent him, but it's okay. So, um, 
Our, our project is called Epic Survival End to End Part Learning for uh, Survival Analysis. This work came out of, um, so I don't know why I'm in the diagnosis and detection group. Our, our work really isn't either of those things. Um, uh, the survival model was built in order to uh, do the final goal of cancer subtyping. And this, this model emerged out of our previous work where we took an unsupervised approach to cluster, cluster together different histomorphologies in the tissue and then see if any of those histomorphologies have any correlation to survival. Um, so we wanted to build uh, a more supervised approach to really push those clusters to be relevant to survival. Um, but the problem is uh, build, building a survival model with large tissue is a problem is uh, this two-stage approach where you learn on timing and then you have to somehow aggregate all the information together. So our model uh, does that um, it, it allows us to um, learn a survival model on full slides, and then we can then use clusters to do further subtyping. I look forward to the questions. Okay, thank you for that. And the next speaker, please. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Mark Endo. I'm an undergraduate student at Stanford University, and I'll be presenting our group's work on CheckSay combining expert annotations with DNN-generated saliency maps for X-ray segmentation. The black box nature of neural networks represents a barrier to physicians' trust and model adaptation in the clinical setting. Saliency maps are a popular set of explanation methods, but they have been shown to be untrustworthy <laughs> for medical image interpretation. Segmentation models can produce more accurate pixel level maps, but their training is typically limited by the time consuming process of collecting expert annotations. We introduce a semi supervised method for multi pathology segmentation that leverages both the pixel level expert annotations and the saliency maps generated by the image classification models. We utilize the Chexpert data set in which there are 150 radiologists annotated, annotated labels. In our method, per pixel segmentation masks are created by processing GradCam generated saliency maps with either thresholding or using IRNet. We find that selecting an expert annotation with a probability of 90% results in the best MIU performance of 0 0.270, beating the weekly supervised method with an MIU of 0 0.156 and the fully supervised method with an MIU of 0 0.246. Our paper includes further experiments on using various encoder initializations and comparing performance with radiologists. For more details, please come to our poster session and read our paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask all the panelists who are currently not speaking to mute their microphone because I think we're having some background noise. Thank you. All right, so um, please, as Colin was mentioning before, um, write your questions in the chat or if you want, you can also raise your hand. Please remember to prefix your questions with the paper number. Um, in the meantime, I uh, have. I can also start with a question, Christian. Oh yeah, okay, go for it. You have a question for the paper, which we currently still see on the screen. Uh, so for L9 from the Stanford group, I can imagine that the user saliency maps for uh, the segmentation network in the end. And you find that an, a probability of 0.9 for selecting the the, the 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 expert annotations is is most optimal. I could imagine that this depends on the quality of the classification network that you have, because if you have a classification network which perhaps performs better and and hence has better saliency maps, that is this optimal point, this 0.9 changes. Can you com comment or elaborate on that? Yes, so we found the 0.9 to be optimal for this particular data set, but um, yeah, definitely if it was kind of a higher quality, if we have higher quality saliency maps from the classification model, then it would introduce less noise and we could probably see a, a better results using a, a little bit lower uh, probability of the expert annotations. So your recommendation would be to to optimize this parameter on a on an internal validation set, basically. Yes. So yeah, we we exactly do that. We um, get it using the optimization of a validation set. Okay. Thanks. I have a question for uh, the authors of 
paper L7. That is the active learning paper. So um, I was wondering if you could give us a little bit more insight about this clustering stage in your paper. Um, so you mentioned, so it's actually in the paper, in the title, that your method is based on something called a gist set. So what, what exactly yeah. is a gist set and what, what is kind of the intuition behind that? Yeah, uh, so they are uh, actually core set. They are kind of uh, points that are representative of the data set, you know, uh, the data uh, data point that has uh, a dense uh, neighborhood. I type like uh, there, there are many data points surrounding uh, that core point. Okay. Uh, is that a, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thanks a lot for the clarification. Yeah, okay. um, I think we have a question from the audience for paper L9. Um, that would be the, exactly the check sec. Question is, why were humans better at predicting cardiomegaly? Yeah, so uh, um, the performance of the, the model is definitely dependent on the number of labels that we have for each different pathology. Um, so that's one of the, the factors that can impact it and make it so humans are better at predicting. Another reason is that some are just more uh, kind of difficult to segment than others. So that's probably one of the more difficult ones for the computer. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Thanks a lot. Um, another question from my side for the authors of the EPIC survival paper. Um, I was wondering, um, I actually have two questions. So um, you currently predict the survival from histopathology alone, correct? Um, yeah, but, exactly. But also in your paper, you mentioned some methods that predict survival from um, using, you know, surrogate measures or other measures or, or other metrics rather, um, if I understood correctly. And my kind of intuition is that, you know, the histopathology can only give you very local information, but it would also matter where exactly the tumor is and all these kinds of things. So um, do you think there is a potential of integrating other information in your predictive framework as well? Yeah. So uh, to answer your first question, yeah, we're only using histopathology. I'm not sure what you're referring to with other inputs. Um, Maybe you're referring to the kind of the loss function we're using, which is a combination of uh, clustering, a combination of Cox proportional hazard modeling, and a combination of um, trying to stratify different um, risk groups uh, s separate from the from the tissue. But yeah, I mean, uh, in our well, in our um, groups, yeah. sorry. Yeah, so what I was referring to is you you mentioned those um, A J C C metrics and these things for predicting survival in, in conventional ways. Are those also yeah. histopathology based? No, those aren't, those aren't histopathology based. So those are, um, so the, the standard um, grading system for this uh, cancer does not have any histopathology um, inclusion in it at all. That staging system includes information like uh, what is the tumor size, um, has the tumor metastasized, and it's a hierarchical tree of decision-making that leads to different staging um, that comes from um, clinical information and some radiology imaging information. Okay. But I mean, in in our group, we we do try to tie in different clinical variables. Um, I think the more interesting thing that you can do, however, is um, model the survival, predict the risk scores, and then see if um, the different uh, groups have correlation to other clinical variables. For example, um, stage or ge genetic mutations or or um, you know, just more basic clinical factors. Mm -hmm. um, so that allows you to do two things. It allows you to one correlate, potentially correlate histomorphology patterns to clinical variables, but also through the combination of predict, like creating a, a risk score using histopathology, you can combine it with the other things used hier using hierarchical trees and develop new staging systems mm -hmm. that include histopathology, because right now none of them do. Okay. All right, thanks for the clarification. I saw that um, Philippe Weitz has their hand raised. Did you want to ask a question about one of the papers? Uh, no, sorry, that's still from saying that I'm here. Okay, 
Um, I don't know um, if, Colin, have you been uh, watching the time? I think perhaps it's actually time to move on to the next group of papers. Um, or is the, are there any last questions at this point? I think we have okay. a bit more, bit more time, but if there are no we questions, do have. we do okay. Okay. Um, So maybe I have one last question for the um, active learning people for um, paper L7 Go. So you have some um, experiment in there showing that your approach doesn't work with labels that were automatically extracted from clinical reports, which are noisy. So do you, um, can you draw any general recommendations from your experience with this work about active learning with noisy labels um is there anything that we can take away from this yeah actually uh after working on uh chest radiograph uh, for quite some time uh we uh found out that uh the agreement between uh, uh annotators uh are quite hard you know uh because chest x-ray is very uh ambiguous so uh, we have to do uh, many routes uh, to get a good label uh, yeah for, for active learning to work okay all right good so thanks again for the clarification i think if there aren't any last questions at this point then we will move to the second group of papers which really is the first group of papers um has the author of l5 shown shown up in the meantime no oh, okay all right anyway so i will pass the word to colin for the second part of this thanks christian yeah, then i would like to invite the authors of the paper l4 and indeed the slide is already on the screen to enable their microphone and um, pitch the first paper. The floor is yours. Uh, hey, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay, yeah. So I'm Philip Weitz. I'm currently a PhD student at the Department for Medical Epidemiology and Biostatistic at Karolinska Institute. And I'm doing a PhD on histopathology image analysis. And um, so the question that we are looking into um, with this project is basically how to use um, uh, immunohistochemistry um, as a label for paired H&E images, um, particularly if the um, slides are not consecutive. So if like a exact registration of the uh, two images is not possible. And um, so far we have investigated this in a paired set of 126 matched um, KI67 and H&E um, whole slide images. Um, and we compared four different methods, one based on registering the images, uh, to basically get a local label, one on just using the um, immunohistochemistry derived label as a weak label for um, the entire HME image, and then two um, that are based on um, cyclegan where we do stain transformation. Um, so once we basically um, uh, train on um, uh, fake uh, immunohistochemistry images that we generate, and once we um, uh, predict on the other modality. So we basically do the transfer like um, in both direction once and see uh, how well that works. And so far, um, we only saw that um, predicting, um, you know, the training on generated images uh, performed worse than the other three methods. Um, but since we used a quite small data set so far, um, we couldn't really make any more interesting conclusions um, regarding the comparison of the other three methods. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is to upscale this study to a cohort of more than 1,500 um, whole slide images and basically um, see how the comparison turns up then. Um, and we'd be very interested in um, hearing your thoughts on this if you have interesting questions um, that we could look into with this data set, basically. Thanks a lot, Philippe. And I would like to welcome the authors of L six to present their paper. OK. 
cannot hear you yet. We see you, but we do not hear you yet. Is it better? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So today um, I'm presenting a work uh, that was de developed uh, with my colleagues from the University of Calgary. So I'm Pauline, I'm a PhD candidate there. Um, and so uh, in this work, we are using uh, brain 3D brain MRI from healthy adults. Uh, and so the main idea uh, of this study uh, was to develop a single model to solve several tasks, including brain age prediction, age condition template generation, uh, and also subject specific aging synthesis. Uh, we also wanted to develop a modular approach that was easy and inexpensive to train. So our model is made of uh, three main parts, including an autoencoder, um, um, an invertible uh, latent space disentanglement module, and a Gaussian mixture model uh, that allows us to turn our deterministic autoencoder into a generative model. And uh, concerning the results, uh, for the brain age prediction task, we obtain results comparable to the uh, state-of-the-art um, models. Uh, and for the generated uh, age condition templates, we obtained uh, realistic templates that show natural aging patterns uh, with, for example, the brain ventricles uh, increasing with aging. Um, we are also able to generate uh, realistic uh, simulated images. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. You very much. Please mute your microphone as we hear an echo now. Thank you. Okay, the pa both papers are open from questions from the audience, and I see that we already have a question in the chat. So this uh, question is for paper L6. Have you considered looking at the whole brain instead of focusing only on the lateral ventricles? For example, including the hippocampus or other regions of interest which are known to vary with age? Yeah, so that's our uh, next step. Uh, this was like kind of a preliminary study. So we cropped our 3D images to have uh, smaller images uh, for like memory constraints and uh, optimization problems, but uh, the next step is to optimize the model to work on the full brain images. Okay, thank you. And as, as a follow-up question to that, uh, I think in the paper you also correlate your score with the volume of the lateral ventricles. So how would a, a segmentation network which would segment the ventricles and measure the volume compare to this, this approach? And is that something you considered to also do? Of course, you need to get uh, uh, annotations then, which is expensive, but um, have you considered that? So, yeah, what we did in the paper is to have some kind of quantitative evaluation of our templates. Uh, we, well, not manually, but like we use region growing to segment the ventricles and look at the volume in order to have a quantitative measure of uh, ventricular growth. Um, so that's uh, how we did it here. Uh, but yeah, for for sure, like when we'll move to the full brain, uh, we'll in also inspect other structures, right? Because other brain structures are also supposed to uh, atrophy with aging. Um, so that's something that we we'll, we will investigate. Okay. Okay. Great. I think one other follow up question to this from the audience. Have you tried to train with unhealthy brains and alter the age of unhealthy brains to predict tumor growth, for example? Uh, so no, for now we work only with uh, healthy brains because that's the big big database that we currently have. Uh, but with the model, it's definitely something that we can easily do. So for example, now we are uh, disentangling the age uh, uh, information, but we could consider having, uh, for example, uh, disease stage information, uh, if we think about dementia or uh, Parkinson's disease, for example. So the idea is really like the model architecture can be applied to a lot of different settings um, easily, I would say.
Okay, thank Can you. Can I jump in with a question for the other paper, L4? So, um, so I was wondering, so you have on the one hand these H and E stained images that can kind of reflect the morphology, and on the other hand, these uh, KI67 images. And so I'm definitely no expert in this area, but I'm kind of wondering um, how kind of medically or why is this information about the processes involved in KI67 visible from a H and E stained image? What what stuff in there gives you this information? Um, so basically, uh, KI67 is a protein that's expressed um, during all um, phases of uh, cell division. And at least um, mitotic uh, count can be detected in uh, H and E. So we know that at least one phase of these phases is um, detectable there. Um, and I mean, there's of course, um, I mean, I'm no pathologist, so I can't tell you for sure what uh, morphology exactly we're looking for. Um, but um, just statistically, since um, the K67 label is um, basically the whole tumor average of um, cells that undergo um, cell division, so it's the percentage of cells that positive across the whole tumor, um, even if not all of these uh, phases of the cell cycle are detectable from H and E, we know that there's at least one phase. And um, so we're quite uh, confident that um, uh, we can extract at least uh, some good signal on um, on the uh, case score from H and E. Okay, thanks. That makes sense. Um, could I ask you something else about? So um, I, I was uh, briefly reading through your paper, and it, it wasn't quite clear to me how the weak labels were generated for this first step. So does that mean you only have one label per whole slide image or what exactly is a weak label in this context? Uh, exactly. So, uh, I mean, uh, since the um, H and E or generally um, histopathology whole slide images are gigapixel scale, one quite common method is to basically chop them into small image patches. And um, something that's frequently done is then simply to assign the whole image label to all of these um, basically image the patches. Um, so that's what we okay. refer to as a weak label here. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Thanks. And then at the inference time, you run it per uh, tile. And then in the end, I think if I understand correctly, you average the output of all the tiles. Is that to get a whole slide score? Exactly, exactly. So uh, here we will predict um, with all modeling approaches that we have, we would predict on. Um, all uh, every single tile and then get the whole two more average basically which corresponds to how ki67 is currently uh, scored at least in scandinavia i think in uh, germany it's maybe hotspot based um, but yeah uh, that that corresponds quite well to how it's actually done by a pathologist okay another question you in the end did a, a five-fold cross-validation on these uh, 126 um, cases. Did you see differences uh, in, in the optimal hyperparameters or in the training of these different models? That you, because in the end, then you have five models. Mm -hmm. Did you see the differences there? Um, we didn't do excessive hyperparameter tuning so far because we thought that um, with a data set this small, basically, um, we would probably only pick up on noise. So we only basically used hyperparameters that we knew uh, to work well on regression um, uh, prediction tasks from other uh, projects that we worked on. Okay, thanks. One, one other question for this paper, and then we can go back to the other paper because we have no, another question from the audience. One other thing I wondered is, uh, so now you tried four approaches in this uh, first set of 126 um, cases, and you're, you now want to scale this up. Um, and I think the final metric which you reach is, um, 0.546, and I think now you want to to scale this up to a larger numbers. And I was wondering, wh when is the experiment correlation high enough so that you can replace the uh, the specific 
KI76 staining with this score that you get from the H and E slides? Do you have a some ballpark number or rough estimate where you think you need to go in terms of performance with this system? Um, so I think it's really difficult to express this in uh, Spearman correlation um, because what we are actually interested in is um, stratifying ER positive ca uh, breast cancer patients, which is a subgroup of the patients that we looked at so far. So once we have more data, basically we can focus on the subgroup. And then what you want to do inside the subgroup is basically to compute an AUC um, that you compute um, on cutoff values. Um, I think currently, um, Oh, point like 10% positive cells and 30% positive cells um, are basically the interesting values that are used. So if you're below 10% or above 30%, uh, treatment decision can be made uh, based on this score. And the uh, area between these scores is basically um, uncertain. So it, uh, basically more information needs to be collected. Uh, so we would look at um, basically AUCs at these cutoff points. Um, later on uh, once we really uh, can focus on the subgroup of ER positive patients. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you plan to do that when you have the full study. Exactly, exactly. But right now I think we would be left with uh, like only two thirds of our cases even. So it didn't really yeah. make sense to already do this analysis now. Makes sense. Okay, then we go back to a question from the audience for paper L6. Can you elaborate a bit on how you were able to disentangle the latent space in order to isolate the H estimation? Yeah, so we used uh, the idea of matrix of space projection. Uh, so currently the, the invertible module is uh, just a linear uh, function that can be, so it can be easily inverted. Uh, and so technically speaking, it's uh, just like two dense layers with uh, linear activation and shared weights. Um, and basically they are trained with a loss that has two components. Uh, the first part is uh, basic uh, mean squared error reconstruction loss. And the second part of the loss uh, makes sure that the age uh, estimation um, uh, is correspond to the true age of the the patient. Um, so right now it's just a linear operation, but what's in also interesting is that you can replace this module with, for example, uh, in our group, we worked on invertible neural networks uh, where you can also have uh, like inverse nonlinear functions. Uh, so we could think about replacing what's, uh, what we have now by an invertible neural network, for example. Okay, I hope that answers the question yes it does uh, another question for paper l4 did you look at the paper d7 which uses cycle again with adaptive instance normalization to transfer between h and e and er2 domain if so could you com comment on the differences between their model results versus yours um no actually i'm on vacation right now i'm only here for this brief instance, so I didn't take a look at anything else. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? No. Then I have one question for paper L6. Um, you mentioned that your, your your paper has three aims. One is to predict the age, which I completely understand. And I think similarly to what I just asked the other authors, in the end, you want to do an analysis in which you use this system to predict people who have an older biological age than they actually are, which is then a, a symptom of a degenerative brain disease. But the other two aims, uh, one was to create uh, template images, um, and the third one I forgot. Um, could you elaborate a bit on what the goal there is? Um, I mean, one, one, one thing I think is that it is an explainable AI system and that you can show that what it is uh, reconstructing, reconstructing actually makes sense. Um, but is that the only aim or is there another aim? 
So for templates generation, uh, we thought that this could be useful. Like a lot of studies use uh, registration uh, to templates for segmentation purposes, for example. And whenever you are studying a specific age group, like elderly in the case of dementia, uh, templates like brain atlases are not always available uh, matching the age of your study group. Um, so this is uh, one reason uh, for this. And then for uh, simulating new images and being able to visualize the impact of age uh, for a specific subject, uh, this can be uh, used uh, exactly like in explainable AI, uh, for example, uh, to generate counterfactuals. Uh, we didn't show any example in our paper, but it's like uh, really feasible with this model like you can simply take an input patient and disentangle the latent space manually modify the age component so for example if this patient is 30 you can put the age uh, to a value of 70 for example to visualize what his brain should look like uh, when he's 70 and then um, for example use that to simulate uh, longitudinal data or even to uh, check if there is uh, any deviation uh, from the normal uh, with this patient. Yeah, OK, clear. Thanks. OK, if there are no other questions from the audience, Christian, do you have any remaining questions? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot to all the authors for your nice presentations and for answering the questions. Yeah, please, if there are remaining questions, um, there is a poster session where you can still discuss this with the authors. And then I think, Christian, we will end this session. We wish everybody a happy last hours of the conference and Philippe a great holiday. Um, and with that, I think we can end this session, Christian. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot for co-chairing and okay. yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference and go to the poster session. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.